Now, through the years, <clears throat> there have always been very popular Christmas toys that every kid wanted. And uh, when our boys were growing up, it was Transformers, uh, Cabbage Patch Kids, and Care Bears. But with the popularization of the Internet in the mid-'90s, the search for these had-to-have toys really got out of hand. I mean, some of you will remember the craze of the most sought-after toy of the mid-'90s, a $29 Sesame Street doll named Tickle Me Elmo. And it had this little chip inside of him that when you tickled him, he'd say, ooh, that tickles. <laughs> and, and the demand so exceeded the production of Tickle Me Elmo's that those $29 dolls were selling for several hundred dollars. People were actually getting into fights in the stores over grabbing those dolls. And one woman in Florida paid $3,500 for a Tickle Me Elmo. Now, she had to have been a grandparent because no parent would do that. We know what kids are like. You know, parents do. The grandparents don't. <laughs> there, was, there was such a mad dash for Elmo's that desperate shoppers were even getting on this new, new thing, this Internet, and they were putting classified ads out over the Internet saying, you know, I'll pay this amount, I'll pay that amount. You know, you just send it to me. I'll send you the money. And there was, there was, it was just amazing. And I, I thought back then, you know, if an alien happened to come to our planet in 1996, they would, in December, they would have surely thought that the meaning of Christmas was the search for Elmo. <laughs> but, you know, Christmas is, is about a whole other kind of search. A search, I think, that's still going on today that's far greater than the search for must-have toys. At this time in America, I think there is a whole nation of people who are seeking something. Because of the epidemic, the, the pandemic, I think people are looking around and they're seeing the collapse of materialism. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. There's something that can devastate your life. They're seeing the futility of hedonism. It doesn't matter how much pleasure or how much, uh, you know, how much entertainment you have. Uh, it's, that's not going to help you. The uncertainty of life in the midst of this pandemic is, is causing people to wonder, you know, where can I find the answers to the basic questions of life? I mean, why am I here? What, what, what's going on here? What's the meaning of life? Is, is there a purpose in life? Is there a God? And if there's a God, does he even really care about me and about what's going on? How can I know him? And those kinds of questions, I think, are being asked by millions of people. If you're a spiritual seeker today and you're here, or you're listening online, you've got a lot in common with a group of people connected to the very first Christmas, the wise men. Their story is told in Matthew chapter 2. Some people call them the magi, but the best term for them, I think, is the original seekers. They were seekers after God, searching for truth, searching for a Savior. When I was a kid, I was fascinated by the wise men. Whenever there was a Christmas play, and back then we always had Christmas plays, I always be, wanted to be one of the wise men. I never wanted to be one of those stinking shepherds, you know? And what did I become? I became a shepherd, a pastor. <laughs> but what do those shepherds get to wear, you know? A bathrobe, wow, and, and a, towel for, a towel for their head. I wanted to be a wise man because they always got to wear the crowns and the jewels and the flashy robes and ride on camels. Who were those guys anyway, these mystery guys from the East? The Bible doesn't give us a lot of details about who they really were. In fact, we know less about them than almost any other of the people that you see in nativity scenes. The Bible calls them Magi from the East. And Magi was kind of a combination astronomer, scientist, doctor, philosopher. They were well-educated, and they were very wealthy. They could have come from Persia or India or China. We don't really know, but they, they probably spent several months crossing that Middle Eastern desert to get to Jerusalem. We don't even know how many wise men there were. Now, most people assume there were how many? Three, because one of the, one of the Christmas carols talks about we three men, and, and and they gave three gifts. And so people assume that. But there could have been a dozen for more, or, or more. I, in fact, I did quite a bit of research. And in my research, it said that the Magi often traveled together in caravans. And that gave me pause because I didn't even know Dodge was making caravans back in that day. 
But they, they did, it did say they would be traveling with a, a, real, a small army because they were wealthy. We don't know much about who they are, but let me tell you, we do know what they did. They did three things that enabled them to find God, to find truth. And if you're a seeker today, if you're searching, genuinely searching after truth, if you're genuinely seeking, if you will do these same three things the wise men did, you'll find the truth and you will find him. First of all, they sought the truth. If you want to find God today, you've got to seriously seek the truth, become a seeker. And let me tell you, there's a big difference between seekers and speculators. There are far more speculators in this world than there are seekers. Speculators are people who say, well, I think God is like, uh, my idea of God is, uh, I imagine God to be, see, it doesn't really matter what the speculators think. Just because we think something doesn't make it true. There's a big difference between a speculator and a seeker. Speculators just guess. And your guess is as good as mine, what God is like. But seekers are people who diligently search for the truth. They look for evidence. They search for answers. They ask questions. They don't just make assumptions. They take the time and the effort to find the truth. That's what the wise men did. In, in Matthew 2, uh, after Jesus' birth, it says. And let me just say to you, this was about two years after Jesus' birth when they arrived in Bethlehem. So they don't belong in the nativity scene anyway. They weren't there. After Jesus' birth, two years afterwards, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the child born to be king of the Jews? We observed his star rising and have come to worship him. And in this verse, we see three things that genuine seekers do. First of all, they watch what's happening in the world. They're observant. They look around. They see things that a lot of other people don't see. And they saw, the Magi saw that this star was different. They were alert to it. So the first thing is they watch what's happening in the world. They don't just go stick their head in the sand. Secondly, genuine seekers ask questions. They went all over asking questions. They wondered you know, what, do you, what does this mean? What's this star all about? They started asking people, you know, what, what's this sign about? What's going on in our world? And then third, and this is most important, they did whatever it took to find the answer. And that's where I think we fall short so often. If you're a genuine seeker, I encourage you to do that. You know, do whatever it takes to discover the truth about why I'm here about what my purpose in life is, about is there a God, does God care? It's so ironic that when Jesus was born, the majority of the religious scholars in the world were concentrated in Jerusalem, only six miles away from Jesus' birthplace, but not one religious leader went six miles to search for Jesus. These guys, these wise guys that did come, they weren't even believers. They were pagans from a faraway country, but they were genuine seekers. And they were ready to do whatever it took. And they found Jesus. Probably took them, like I said, four to six months to get there. That reveals a, a very serious commitment to searching for the truth. And the problem is, today, in America, we've grown up in a microwave culture. We want everything immediately, you know. And we don't want to take the time to find it. We want to know the truth, but we don't want to take the time to dig in and, and search for it. We want to know God, but we won't, don't want to take the time to find out about him. And that's a tragedy. To go all the way through life and never figure out why I am here. Never discover what is the reason, what's the meaning, what's the purpose of this life. That's a wasted life. No wonder so many people in our culture feel unfulfilled, wondering if they really matter feeling unsatisfied, feeling insignificant, confused about life. God created you for himself to have a relationship with you. There's a God-shaped vacuum in every human heart. The Bible says there's, there's a hole there, there's a void that nothing else can fill. Not money, not fame, not pleasure, not possessing all kinds of things. Only God can fill that emptiness, and that's really what you're searching for. 
And the good news is this. God wants you to get to know him. He wants to have a relationship with you. The God who created everything wants to have a relationship with you. So notice what he promises in Jeremiah 29, 13. When you search for me with all your heart, whatever it takes, like the Magi, when you search for me with all your heart, you will find me. What a great promise. That's the good news. He wants you to meet him. He wants you to know him. So if you're not a believer but you are a seeker, you really seriously want to know the truth, you want to know God, congratulations, because God loves seekers. He loves people who genuinely want to know him. God wants you to know him. He wants you to love him. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to follow him. He wants to have a relationship with you. And that's what Christmas is all about. That's what we've been singing about. The essence of Christianity is that God came to this earth in human flesh because he wanted to start not a new religion, but a relationship with the people that he created. This week, Karen and I were in a meeting with a social security specialist and a retirement specialist and and I don't know he mentioned religion and uh, he knew I was a pastor and and I said you know what God's not interested in religion it kind of shocked him I said religion is man's attempt to get to God religion is rules and regulations and rituals but God is not interested in that he's interested in a relationship with you a relationship of love A relationship that is controlled by love, not by rules and regulations and rituals. And when you grasp that fact, you're you're really going to begin to enjoy Christmas. The wise men sought the truth. Secondly, they experienced the joy. All of us need to enjoy the fact. That God has already taken the first step. God has initiated the relationship with us by sending his son and by enticing us, or I kind of like to call it wooing us, to get to know him. See, with the Magi, it was that star that got their attention. And I believe that God gets our attention by giving us some kind of sign, some kind of clue, some kind of uh, uh, experience. He provides, like he did for them, a travel guide so that we can find him. And I believe he does this for any genuine seeker. He never just leaves you out there on your own. He gives you a travel guide to help find him. And in the wise man's, wise man's case, that travel guide was this very special star, a supernatural star. You know, I know people have tried, you know, to explain it away in various uh, physical things, but there's no star that ever performed like this star. The Bible said it led him all the way from the east directly to Jerusalem, and then it disappeared, and and then it reappeared, and then it turned south and went to Bethlehem. No normal star does that, you know, and and disappear for, you know, and then reappear, and then end up settling right over the house where Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus were. And there's no indication from Scripture that anybody else ever saw that star. It seems to be a special star, custom-made for the wise guys. Really, throughout history, God has used different kinds of instruments to get people's attention. You know, he parted the Red Sea, brought down manna from heaven. He had a pillar of fire by day, uh, night and cloud by day. And uh, he's fed 12,000 people from five loaves and two fish. And, you know, they're just all the way through Scripture. You see God getting people's attention. And he uses different kinds of signs. But he always rewards genuine seekers with clues, with a travel guide, a star, something to help them move forward in their search. Chances are you have a star in your life. In fact, I know you do. You may have just never recognized it. God put it there to guide you to him. That star may be a book that you read or a person you know or an experience that you've had, or a TV show or movie that you've watched, or some event that you were involved in. It could be a church. It could be a teacher. 
my stars were named Dad and Rob. And a book, The Christian Secret of a Happy Life by Hannah Will Smith and Roy. And I have no doubt that God has brought people across your path or things into your life to be a travel guide to bring you to him. Maybe a believing parent or a spouse who's a believer or, or a neighbor or a friend or fellow worker or, or even, a, even one of your children. But God does not He never leaves genuine seekers without a travel guide, without a star to help lead us. So what is the star? Or who is the star in your life? See, there are three possible reactions when God begins to guide your life, when God begins to work in your life, and and you start to realize, maybe God is talking to me. Maybe God is using this person or this book or, or, or this, this class or whatever it is to guide me. There are three reactions you can have. You can react like Herod did in fear. He was afraid to be guided by God. I mean, really, he, just, he, he wanted to be in charge. He didn't want anybody to guide him. And, or you can react like the religious leaders did. They were just indifferent, apathetic, skeptical. Or you can, exa- you, you can react like the wise men did. They celebrated They rejoiced. They experienced the joy of being led by God. Matthew 2.10 says, And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. If you're a believer, I want to challenge you to do something this Christmas season. I want to challenge you. You're already thinking about the stars in your life. I want you to thank God. Take some time and just thank God for those stars in your life. For those travel guides, whether it's people or things or events or whatever, thank God for the guiding lights that he used to lead you to the Savior and rejoice greatly for them. And if you're not a believer, if you're still a seeker, you're still on the way, I want to say to you, use that star. Take advantage of that relationship or that friendship or that book or that class. Let it lead you to God to find the answers to the basic questions of life because God loves you and has a plan and a purpose for your life. He will use anything to get your attention, and that even means pain if necessary or a pandemic. He simply loves each of us too much to let us just drift and wander aimlessly through life. Now, as Ron said earlier in in his welcome, it's been a tough year, 2020. Many of you have had a very rough time. The pandemic has taken a toll on all of us. I've read that there's been more divorces. There have been more suicides. There's, you know, we see marriage problems, job problems, schooling issues. (laughs) That's been a big one. Problems with your kids, financial difficulties, health issues. People have been stymied and they have been stressed. Have you considered that some of those things may be a star? That maybe God is trying to get your attention and saying to you, listen, I I like to think of him as calling me honey. (laughs) Listen, honey, I didn't mean for you to live your life without me in it. Whoever said you're supposed to go through life depending on your own effort, listen, I created you. I created this whole thing. You cannot make it on your own. You need me, and I want to be there for you. On that very first Christmas, the angel said, I bring you the most joyful news ever announced, and it is for everyone. Your Savior has been born tonight. Why is Christmas such good news? It's because of what Christ came to do. He came to be our Savior. He came to be our Deliverer. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to have Jesus as your Savior, your Deliverer, deliverer in this gift of Emmanuel, this gift of Jesus, of God with us? God is saying three things that this gift means. I want to give you forgiveness for everything you've ever done wrong. Where are you going to get that? Where are you going to get that kind of gift? Secondly, I want to give you a purpose to live for and a power to live on. I want to change your life and I want to give you the power that you need to to do that. 
And thirdly, I want to give you the security of knowing there's a perfect home in heaven for you when you die. Now, that's a pretty good deal. In fact, you're never going to get a better Christmas present ever than that. Pardon for your past, power and purpose for your present, and a perfect home for your future. The Bible calls that the good news, salvation. You need to seek the truth. And you need to experience the joy and realize that God has this amazing gift for you. And he's leading you to it. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life to the full. He wants us to have the best life possible. Most people in this world don't live. They just exist. They don't enjoy life. They endure life. They don't thrive. They just seek to survive. And God wants to lift us above all that and give us life in all its fullness. If you want to find God this Christmas, you have to do the same three things the original seekers did. You seek the truth with all you've got. You experience the joy, and then thirdly, you recognize the gift. What makes this baby different from any other baby? Why do we split history into A.D. and B.C. over the birth of this baby? Because the Bible says he was no mere baby. He was God come in human flesh. He was Emmanuel. God came to this earth in human form to be among us so that we could get to know him. You know, there are some things you can know about God just from nature. You can know his power. You can know his majesty. And you can know his creativity. But if Jesus had not come to this earth, If Emmanuel had not come to be with us, you would not know that God is loving and kind and compassionate and caring and that he has a plan and purpose for your life and he is ever available to help you through the thick and thin of life, always there for you. We know these things because God has given us this Christmas gift that we call Jesus who came to this earth in human form to explain and show us exactly what God is like. The Bible says Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God, that Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature and the radiance of his glory. No one has ever seen God, but Jesus has made him known. He has explained him. The really amazing thing of Christmas is that God would so humble himself to become like us as as an infant so that we could get to know him and become like him. You've got to recognize this gift. And the wise men did. They really understood that this baby was God. It's obvious because of the way they reacted when they saw him and because of the presence that they gave him. The Bible says in Matthew 2.11, when the Magi went into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. I don't know when was the last time you bowed down and worshiped a baby. But this was no ordinary baby. It says, and then they opened their treasure chest and they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We know that they recognized him as God because they were filled with awe and they fell to their knees in worship. Sincere investigation by the wise men brought about serious adoration by the wise men. The wise men worshiped him. They didn't worship a star. They didn't worship Joseph or Mary. They bowed down before the baby because Jesus is the only one worthy of our adoration. He is our Savior. And they brought those gifts to indicate who they believed Jesus was. You know, we used to always have uh, Christmas pageants and Christmas programs this time of year. And uh, we'd always have kids in it. And it's always fun to watch those kids and hear, hear the things they come up with. But I remember one little girl, preschooler, and she, she didn't get it quite right. She said, and the maggots. <laughs> yeah, you know where I'm going. And the maggots brought baby Jesus gifts of gold, Frankenstein, and Smurfs. <laughs> Almost, but not quite. But they did bring gold. Representing royalty. In those days, you always offered gold to the king. Gold was the most precious metal. And so in giving it, they were saying, this baby is our king. And then frankincense, a very rare and expensive incense, frankincense was burned in the temple to worship God. And they were saying, this child is God. He is worthy of our worship. And the final gift 
was myrrh, a spice that's used in the ancient world to embalm dead bodies. Now, why in the world would you give a death spice to a baby? Because they recognize he's not only our king and our God, he is our savior. He is the one who has come not only to show us what God is like, but to show us the ultimate love in giving his life for us so that our sins can be forgiven and that we can have new life. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his unique son, that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. God always takes the initiative. He gives us this Christmas gift. He gives us those stars. In order to enjoy a gift, two things are necessary. When you start to open your gifts on Christmas Day, if you're going to enjoy those gifts, you've got to be able to recognize them and you've got to receive them. You ever got a gift that you didn't have the slightest idea of what it was? You know, you open this package and whoa, this is great. What is it? You know? You can't use a gift that you don't recognize. And until you recognize that Jesus really is God, come in human flesh so that we can have a relationship with him, Christmas makes no sense to you. You've got to recognize the gift. Emmanuel, God is with us. But more than that, you've got to receive it. So this Christmas, I invite you to recognize the gift, realize who Jesus really is, and then receive God's gift. Receive his son into your heart and life. Let him fill you with his love. Recognize and receive this gift. The wise men did. And when you do, you show your wisdom as well. The end of the Magi story in Matthew says that after they had seen Jesus and given the gifts, they went home another way. And I believe there's a double meaning in that. Yes, they went home another way geographically to avoid Herod and what Herod wanted to do. But more importantly, I think they went home transformed, changed people. Because you cannot have an encounter with Jesus, the living God and Savior. You cannot experience his unconditional love and forgiveness and remain unchanged. It just changes you. And you're never the same again. As I was growing up, my parents ran a restaurant. And every Christmas, they'd put up a banner that hung, uh, hung, this banner hung from the ceiling in the dining room. And it said, wise men still seek Christ. Each of us came here today for a different reason. Some of you came because it's Christmas time and that's what you do. Or, Or maybe you came because your friend, your star invited you. But regardless of the reason you think that you are here today, you're not here by accident. I believe that long ago, before you were even born, God knew that you would be here at Valley View Church on December 20th, 2020. So he could say to you, I love you so much. You can't imagine how much I love you. You matter to me. I made you for a purpose. I have seen every moment of your life. I've never missed a heartbeat that you've had. I know your sadness and I know your sorrows. I know the good and the bad. I know the things you're ashamed of and the things you're proud of. And I love you. I care about you. I have a purpose and a plan for your life. And I want you to know me just as I know you. That's what God says to each of us today. I am confident that just as God led the original seekers, the wise men, to Bethlehem, he's led you here today. What is it that you're searching for? Maybe you say, oh, I just want to be happy. I just want my kids to grow up safe. or I just want to feel loved. I, 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 I want to feel like my life counts. I want to know why I'm here. I want to know what my purpose is. What is it that you're really seeking for in life? Beneath all those desires of our heart is an even deeper one. Ultimately, and you may have not realized this, never realized it perhaps, what you're hungering for is God because you were made by him. You were loved by him. You were created by him with an empty hole in your heart that only he can fill. He made you to have a relationship with him. 
until you do. Nothing else is going to satisfy. There's nothing wrong at all with being a seeker. In fact, we all start out that way. As I was working on this sermon, I thought of those days back in the, in the early, late, early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, as I began to seek for God. We all start that way, but at some point, you have to step across the line. You have to stop being a seeker and realize that I've got enough evidence to start being a believer. And that's what happened to me 48 years ago. And that's what happened to these wise men centuries ago. They came to Christ as seekers. They left as believers. Their sincere investigation turned into sacrificial adoration and their lives were forever changed. I challenge you this Christmas to give your life to Jesus. Make that your gift to him and receive his gifts that you can't find anywhere else. Pardon for your past, power and purpose for your present, and a perfect home with him forever. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for what you've done for us. And for this season of the year, when we're again reminded of your amazing love for us, how you left your throne in heaven and came to this earth and gave yourself on the cross for us. The unsurpassable gift, Jesus, who came to redeem our life and set us free to really live. We praise you, we honor you, we love and adore you. In Jesus' name, amen.